instead of hearing their loved one's voice for the first time, a dick was jammed into their ear. And they're like, this is sound! <laughs> <laughs> this is get used to sound! <laughs> You watch Tyson fight? I did, unfortunately. You stayed up the whole time for it. I did. I, I stayed up. I was, I was very excited. It brought back, um, like when we used to watch UFC. I was very, um, very mm. pumped for it. You know, I, I had that same butterflies in my stomach. So I've never been like a huge boxing fan. I'm a baby. Was always my thing, but just something about seeing Tyson get in the ring uh, after all this time. And not having to pay a hundred and something dollars for a pay-per-view was uh, enticing for me. I know. That is pretty nice that Netflix got on the game there. I enjoyed... I didn't see the fight because I go to bed at uh, 6.30 if I can because uh, I'm an old man. But I did enjoy afterwards going on Twitter and seeing his ass. Did you see I the pay- just going to say that. What was up with that? I don't know. First of all, he had a Rikishi ass. His ass was the exact... <laughs> dimpled. It was dimpled. It was exactly. <laughs> like, if you went to a machine shop, you'd have to specifically order that finish. That's a dimpled finish. <laughs> yeah. Um, I said this. Like, I, I know everybody now is like, I told you it was going to happen, but I was immediate on the game of he's too old to do that kind of fighting. Um, cigar nipples on him. Conor McGregor called it hilarious. Yeah, he's just, he was on steroids and all that, which is good. You need him to be. You want him to do all those things. Um, you want him to be angry. He was. He started biting his glove in the fight because he had a biting asphyxiation. But, man, he's 60 years old. What are you going to do with do that? You, do, you, do you really think that that it was uh, a legit fight that Tyson only threw, like, 18 punches? Yeah. You he's do? old as fuck. Yeah, yeah, he can't he, throw the same amount of punches anymore. He was throwing that amount of punches in, in training in, like, one combo. I know it's different when you're actually fighting a, a person, but he watched the first minute and a half of that first round, and he was looking pretty damn good, and then they clinched, and then after that clinch, it was uh, it was all done. That'd be fucking sick if they did a WWF turn in the middle, and he's like, it's been fake the whole time! <laughs> That'd be sick. Could you Speaking even be of that, I, I did that? read uh, there was a rumor that um, Triple H is is considering doing something with Logan Paul in Tyson for WrestleMania because they had that little like, uh, interaction at the end. Oh, but it'd be fake. Oh well, yeah, yeah, it would have mm. to be. I would assume. How is Logan Paul in the world of wrestling? Is he like a, a regular established a figure in there? He's a champion. He's a champion. So he yeah. cur- currently I fights. The, I think he's the Intercontinental Champion. Wow, so they, cool. they see the talent him enough to put the belt on him. Well, they see the money in this fucking when he talks. I think he's pretty talented, though. I, I have not watched as much as uh, I thought I was going to start watching again, but the, the few times I've seen him wrestle, he's, he's actually pretty talented. Man, but could you imagine being somebody that most of the world wants to die of a horrific disease like Jake Paul <laughs> and Logan Paul? It's like, damn, they they deserve it by how annoying they are. The whole Japanese murder, the fucking forest and all that stuff. But that's really the best way to make money is to be hated enough where the world is tuning in to watch you lose, a.k.a. Floyd Mayweather style. But, yeah, we should watch a UFC pay-per-view someday. If they, why, why does UFC do that? Why does UFC start at 10 on a main card and make you stay up till fucking 2 in the morning? It makes it so much better if you're from England. You get to watch it like at five o'clock or whatever the hell it is, yeah, or, or six o'clock. <clears throat> why do why do we make England better than us? Why why would we do that? It doesn't make any sense. I think I think it also has to do with uh, like California, right? California would start at six o'clock. Wouldn't well, England be Cal- like the morning or the afternoon? It might be the morning. I might be wrong on all this timing, but still. Who cares about California? <laughs> East Coast is the viewer numbers. Eastern, baby. I don't know. It was nice when they were doing it at 9. 8 o'clock prelims, 9 o'clock start. We on your way home by like 11, midnight. That was nice. Fucking Californians. 
Should how do you feel about comedians when they come from other states? Do you naturally hate them a little bit, or do you go? So like, I just did a show last night at Soho in Hudson, and the headliner Mark Turcott was from Maine. Mm. And I was like, "Get back up there, get the fuck out of here!" Yeah, <laughs> I know you're taking our jobs. <laughs> it's so the easy to feel. <laughs> but it's, f- it's so easy to feel that way. Yeah, if this and Wayne does not like that guy, he wants him to move back to where he came from and crusty old white man. Uh, no, I, so I when you say other states, I'm assuming you're not you're not meaning the uh, the states that are directly next to us, right? Yeah, no, I'm more talking like a Biggie Tupac. We're going uh, West Coast East Coast rivalry type of thing. Like, do you feel that way? Like I do a little bit when I hear uh, like a guy from San Francisco, he's like, "I do seven mics a night." I'm like, "Fuck you." Um, <laughs> I get a little I jealous new... about that ability. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. I, mean, I, I don't love... know how I would feel if they came over here and got on one of our shows. Like, who cares? Yeah, I would. I'd be like, "Get those California people out of here." I'll, I'll, I'll do that kind of racist talk where you don't open your teeth. You just <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know. I feel, I feel vindictiveness a lot, and I like it. I do like the way that it feels to have somebody that you're like, "What do you do that makes you think that you should do this showcase?" Lots of things, probably. I don't even know the person, but I feel that way all the time. Like if Colin Quinn came in and I didn't recognize him, and he went up and got to go on a show, I'd be like, "Who this fucking guy think he is?" <laughs> that was my my natural way to feel. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I feel that way. Um, yes, you do. Shut the fuck up. Everybody does. So you're just too much of a pussy to admit. No, maybe you are right. Yeah, if I don't recognize somebody, I'm like, how how good can you possibly be? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Even if you recognize them, anybody yeah. doesn't matter who they are. I've seen people who are really good comedians get a spot, and I'm like, fuck this guy. Who the fuck? The, who cares about this fuck? <laughs> I know, like I have to catch myself. Like he's good. He's been doing it forever. <laughs> but yeah, I uh, I like that. I'm gonna keep doing that definitely for sure. I think that, that if you can just be Darth Vader about it, that nobody can get mad at you. Like if someone's like, uh, like let's say someone gets on a thing that I like, I'm like that guy fucking sucks. What the hell is he getting spots? And somebody comes around and goes, "What are you jealous?" I'm like, "Yeah, I am. I severely. I don't want him to get anything. I want to get everything." <laughs> As long as you do it like that, who could be mad at you? Yeah, you got to be honest about it. Can't fault you for being honest. Yeah, like uh, every time someone puts up a picture of like, here's all my tour dates, I hate them. Why? Who cares? That's cool that they have that. I wish I had some of the dates. Of these. Mm-mm. Get your stupid shit off my screen. <laughs> I don't. Am I on? Do I get a guest spot on that show? I don't want to know about it then. Speaking of, what shows you got coming up? I'm doing McHugh's on the 30th uh, with you. I think Jim Bishop's McHugh. the headliner. Yeah. Um, pretty That's pretty fun. light this month. I, I was going to do Gibbs on Sunday, but they got canceled because they have a private function, I believe it was. Um, I got a couple dates in December, but I'm not going to go that far ahead. Mm. How about yourself? I am Connecticut bound um, oh, right. for the Mohe- next Mohegan. couple trips. you do Mohegan one night. That's going to be fun. So that's going to be a feature spot. Good comedians do lots of time. Uh, it's very nerve wracking to feature for uh, this reason. And if you guys are newer and you don't know, featuring is the middle act of uh, the lineup. Somebody that's going to do between fifteen and twenty five minutes. That's usually the range of features. Uh, anyways, so the fear is that I'm still bad at comedy in general, which means that if the crowd's good, I'm very good. If the crowd's bad, I'm very bad. So if there's 25 minutes, let's say the max, if I, it's not going to be that amount of time, but if I had to do that amount of time and they were horrible, that imagine bombing an open mic five times in a row, that type of amount of time to do it. And that's a scary feeling to think about. But um, it's the opposite feeling of if you crush five times in a row at an open mic, you get that same type of elation. So it is cool to do longer sets. I feel more comfortable in them. It's fun to try new stuff in them. New stuff always like when you're doing five minute sets or seven minute sets and you try a new joke, it's like twenty five percent of your set. So if it goes bad, it's it's a tough one. But 
when you're doing it and it's 5% of your set, I feel like you can get away with a lot more newer, weirder, edgier stuff because you can always transition out of them. So I'm excited about that. And then I'm on the Bishop show with you. And then I'm back in Connecticut, motherfuckers. Again, living in Connecticut. What's the other one in Connecticut? How are you doing? I'm open for Obi-Wan Katrobi, uh somewhere in the bowels of Connecticut near near Hartford, I think. Somewhere in that range. Yeah, so we'll figure out on next week's episode, De Bombs, uh, how much shit I ate the first time I went to Connecticut. So this should be, this is a redemption one. Mohegan, I don't even feel like it's Connecticut because it's like a melting pot of everybody, even though it's over there. So I am not, like if I do well there, I'm not going to be like, I conquered Connecticut. Uh, I don't know why I would say I conquered Connecticut no matter what I did anywhere, but I'm going to say it if I do good on the 7th of December. If I do good there, I will claim Connecticut as my own. Um, Because I'm pretty sure that I, if you went into Connecticut Napoleon style and you just started shooting cannonballs at buildings, you can take Connecticut. I don't think anybody's stopping you. I don't think anybody wants to. We barely stopped the Capitol riots. It's like, <laughs> what do we do for Connecticut? We would open the doors for you. Yeah, I've never, never performed in Connecticut. God, I hate them. Rhode Island, very close. Very similar vibe of hate. Yeah. That's a hike for you. See? Though. Other states. Yeah, huge hike. Luckily, the um, it's nice for the Connecticut ones because we normally will travel as a group. Mm-hmm. So then you get to just hang out with your buddies in the car, which is not a bad not a bad way to go. Like uh, to Mohegan, uh, Jacques is going to be in the car, which I am very excited for. Oh, my God. Thank God this comes out after I go out there because Jacques, I don't know if I'm going to be alive come Monday, me spending a, a two, four hours in the car with you. I'm sure <laughs> that I am going to try to figure out how to rewire child lock windows. So I could roll my window down and jump out of it. <laughs> no, I'm excited. I'm going to ask him a lot about uh, the fucking um, whatever the dragons are called from uh, uh, that movie Pacific Rim. Kaiju. I'm going to ask him lots about that. He's going to really get me going on it. I'm sure Mike's going to love that. <laughs> he did the first time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, listen, that's that's comedy, baby. Um <laughs> I'm always excited to be on a Jacques show. I think he is he on the thirtieth too with uh, McHugh's. He no. might be. I, um, He's not. No, I don't think so. I could be wrong. The website of McHugh's lists me, Sherry Lynn, and uh, Colleen something as the people on the show, and I don't think those other two are actually on there. I think it's just me and you and Jim and some other guy. Yeah, I forget who the who the other guy was. Yeah, so that's that's exciting. Go see shows, everybody. So what do you... You did your first 20-minute set recently, didn't you? Close to 20 minutes? Yeah, it was, it was just five, 19 minutes, yeah. That was our show. The one in uh, Westford at the Fletcher Club. But I have my I have my second one coming up uh, New Year's Eve down on the Cape. Margaritaville. So this is going to be the first time somebody externally has asked you to do 20 minutes coming up in Margaritaville. What are your thoughts? Are you nervous about doing that amount of time? Are you like, I got it. It's pretty straightforward. How do you feel? I'm not nervous about doing that amount of time. Um, It's just remembering an order from for 15 minutes for me is easy. Adding in that extra five minutes. uh, I'm a little nervous about, if I skip something, you know, because I don't, I don't go up and riff. I, you know, I go up, I, and I, and I have in my head, you know, if all goes well, this is what I'm doing. This, this is my set list. I'm not, uh, I'm not one of those guys, you know, I'm not at the point where I can go up and just go, Hmm, what am I going to talk about? You know, mm-hmm. I have segues and non sequiturs or whatever, whatever the situation is straight down. Um, I have gotten pretty good at calling audibles and taking things out. You know, like we talked about like if, if somebody didn't like a particular joke and there was another joke in the same, or not if a crowd didn't like a particular joke and there was a joke in the same vein, 
I, I've gotten more con- conscience of uh, going, okay, they didn't like that, so I probably shouldn't do this one. Mm-hmm. You know? But to go up and just riff and just pull things out, not at that level. I don't think many good comedians are, to be honest with you. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I watch, like, uh, you know, we watch Steve York. He just goes up and just. He said it to me. Uh, he was like, you know, I, I, I go up and I, I start with this. You know, I, I know I'm going to start with that and just see how it goes. And then I just start pulling from things. And, and what yeah, I, do. I kind of, but I don't think he does like pulling joke for joke. I think it's more chunky than you're thinking. So, for instance, like, I think maybe oh, he starts. Probably. To- yeah, like I'm sure that his like oh, I pull this or this or this or he's talking about 15 minute intervals of time. So it's just kind of like in my set if I'm doing 20 minutes and I want to audible, it's normally always in the middle. Like I'll have my first five minutes are pretty ironclad. Besides the preamble in the beginning to get loose, you can talk to people a little bit more. I like to try to get at least a couple sentences in. But then once I start. The first five minutes are pretty ironclad. And then from there, the topics change a bit. I go from uh, observational uh, family jokes into now talking about kids. And my kids stuff is where the most edge in my set is. You know, that's where if I'm going to say cunt in a set, I say cunt in a set. Well, we shouldn't say that. But we should say that. And say if cunt? I'm on the podcast, I don't know. It makes my thing go down. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we, we've been over this. It fucking fucks us. It fucking fucks us in the cunt. All right, so we... Uh, <laughs> so there is where I've worked in a bunch of segues into different jokes and different avenues. So I kind of in the middle. And then from the middle, it on a 20-minute set is going to end the same way, too. So I try to put safer things in the front and back. Good jokes, of course, but something that I think that most crowds will like. And then if I'm... I want to try some edgy shit that I, I got a new joke about. Um, it's called Internet Mom. It's a, a joke about giving my mom the internet for the first time because she's a fucking immigrant, so she never had um, a cell phone that could connect to the internet. And then we gave her an iPhone. Could you imagine just getting never being on the internet and then getting all of it at once right now in your life? Um, I think that's a be like, very like interesting the, topic. The deaf people who get like that thing on the side of their head and all of a sudden they can hear and they're like oh exactly but imagine <laughs> if like they exactly. were instead of hearing their loved one's voice for the first time a dick was jammed into their ear and they're like this is sound <laughs> <laughs> this is get used to sound <laughs> uh so yeah so that's the joke man it ends it's a uh, you know it's a bit maybe a good way to describe it is like a uh, i don't want to call it an anthony jeselnik bit but you know anthony jeselnik bits will start off and you're like Oh, this is like a harmless premise, and then he'll have a dark, dark, dark turn at the end. Yeah. Uh, so it has something like that, and and uh, those tend to be my favorite type of jokes. So I'm excited about it, but that would be never one I would do in the beginning or at the end of a set. Like right now, if I'm trying that, it's smack that in the middle so I can work my way out of it if it pisses people off. Yeah, you know, we've talked about it before, but I think you really have to work in the beginning to get people on your side, especially where people don't know you. It's not like they're not there to see you, right? Uh, it'd be one thing if you had a big group there that weren't there to see you and they know your sense of humor and they know all that, then yeah, are they going to laugh at that kind of joke in the beginning? Yeah, but people who don't know you, that could really uh, put a bad taste in their mouth early on. So that's something I've worked on myself. Um, trying to make my the top of my set heavy into uh, becoming likable. <clears throat> Did you die? Oh, I thought you fell forward. No, I'm back. No, uh, no, I, uh, I to throw something away. Yeah, um, yeah, I noticed a lot of people put self-deprecation in the beginning of their sets. That's a nice tip on if you're structuring your sets for real shows for the first time. And you're wondering, like, the, I think the biggest mistake that comedians make are not doing that, like you said, introducing the crowd properly to you in the beginning so that you're likable and then you can get your stuff in. Say it a hundred times, a hundred thousand times in the podcast. But my first line was uh, when I first started comedy was the first dick pic I ever took. I had to take to a store to a guy to develop it. And I'm going to try that line. I didn't tell you this, but I'm going to try that line again. 
So I have a, a bit that I'm going to stick that into that I think is going to work. And I'm going to do it in the middle of my set. And I'm going to prove to myself that I can make that work by being a better comedian. The same exact line. Is that a... Can I take a wild guess on where you're going to throw that line? Yeah, bitch. I fucking... <laughs> what do you want me to say? <laughs> is it going to go in a dick shrinkage? It is going to go in a dick shrinkage. Nice job. Yeah, yeah. That's good. That makes sense. It's the only place it could go. But yeah, I thought about it to the end of that joke. That's true. Yeah, and I just, I thought about it and it just clicked for me. I'm like, oh, that's a perfect line to maybe end that joke. You know, because the end of the joke of dick shrinkage is that uh, dicks are worthless because we've wasted all of the equity of dicks on dick pics. Um, The way I describe it, it's kind of like if you're super afraid of Dracula uh, but then every day Dracula shows you a picture of how hard it is for him to get out of his coffin. You're going to be less afraid of Dracula uh, by the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think if I say like like dick pics are so valuable, the first ones I have to take, I had to take to a guy to develop it. I think I can get a laugh there. And that's like literally if I get a laugh there, I'm going to stop my set. i be like, thank you. That's all I was looking for. You guys have a good <laughs> night. <laughs> you know, so, something uh... – Something I, I've, I've noticed for myself, um, you know, I, I'm working on a couple new jokes. Um, the one about Great Wolf Lodge and then one about um, the, the celebration of life, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. I feel like those two jokes are a step towards me and uh, me me performing more as myself. If that makes sense, mm-hmm. so it's a little more like I, I feel like it just kind of flows. It's more like a, it's more like I'm telling the story of those things. Yes, found that pretty interesting. That you know, I'm, I'm, I have a few jokes like that, but those two in particular, just it seems almost like I don't want to say my voice yet, but it's a little one step closer towards my voice, and it's more how I would talk when I'm on a roll in the office, you know, just kind of just kind of ad libbing on shit. Mm. You know, you know, yeah, well, I'm trying to think of what my new jokes have been like. They've been very similar. Absurd observationalism. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited about trying a, a bit I wrote in London on um, Sunday, Mookie, and that's going to be fun. Hmm. Pissing, pissing in the face of, of people. <laughs> I love that joke. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm looking forward. I'm, I'm going to try to. I think I'm going to make it to 19 card of this uh, in a couple weeks. Nice. Yeah, I, will, I have to be at that one. It's my turn, so I'm going to be there. Speaking of, sign up for the fucking mic, please. If you're listening to this, if you haven't already, you everybody's like, oh, open mic pain, and you guys don't have an open mic. We co-produce one now, so shut your fucking stupid mouth and come to this mic and reopen it. Because we're going to give you some time. And it's in an old church. So God is watching because he's still the landlord. And we like to piss him off by playing music real loud. And they actually have a Bose sound system, which, all kidding aside, is one of the best array sound systems in the world. So you get to hear your voice crisp clean. Get to work on jokes in front of me, Justin George, the piece of of shit in the world. It's going to be uh, hosting. If he's listening, he's going to correct my grammar in his head while he's driving. I hope you miss your exit, you piece of shit. And uh, <laughs> it'll be, it'll be a good, <laughs> it'll be a good show. I'm excited to open mic a little bit and work on things. I got to go to Mulligans for the first time in a while. Um, a couple with weeks beautiful ago. Dan, beautiful Dan Cronin came with me, which was great to introduce him to everybody up there. And yeah, it just felt good to work on new stuff, like. When you're doing shows, you work on kind of one new joke at a time because you can't just completely tank your set work on stuff. It's really nice going to an open mic again and just being like, here's five new minutes, and then just getting a couple of those to work. It feels so good. Um, I'm really excited about a joke I have about substitute teaching that um, our boy Jacques has become a substitute teacher, and it has inspired lots of thought about kids.
speaking of Jacques, we were talking earlier today, me you and Jacques, about um, having respect for clean comics. And uh, I yeah, that's books. an interesting conversation to me. Yeah, I, I actually listened to uh, Tom Papa's new special today uh, hmm. while I was, you know, cooking and doing dishes and stuff. You say pretty good. I always like Tom. You Papa. fucking girl, you clean comic girl. Yeah, he, uh, I was doing the dishes and cleaning. He 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 drove me nuts a little bit. I don't know if he's always done this, but I've never picked up on it. But he has this this thing where he he says something and then he repeats it in like a little bit different way uh, to kind of like hammer the point across, which was funny. Like the first couple times he did it, but he, I think I feel like he did it like twelve times during the whole thing. And I was like, like a Chris Rock style, Tom. like what? Like the classic Chris Crick, uh, Chris Rock style. Um, you know, I'm talking about. But he's like, people gonna cheat. That's right, everybody. People gonna. I can't do black voice. Oh my god, they're gonna <laughs> fucking. <laughs> Someday I'm gonna get on SNL and they're gonna play that line. We're like, look at him do black voice. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> no, it, not quite like that, but more like I, I can't even think of like a specific line. But he'd be like, you know, and then he made bread, and then he made bread. Like he just did that mm. over and over again. I was like. Relax that a little bit. I know he you're talking about such good bread, sourdough, sourdough king. God, I tried to get a sourdough started years ago. I, I couldn't. I couldn't do it. You have it's to like kill an old lady to get it. Yeah, you have to. It's a pet that lives forever that only old ladies from Italy own. Yeah, I know somebody that has a starter, and she's like, "Yeah, let me know when you want some." And I was like, "Hey, I want some." I haven't gotten it yet. She's like, I was saying that to be polite. Don't actually make me do something, you <laughs> piece of shit. So yeah, this is this is a, a let's have this conversation because it is interesting. You like clean comedy. I do not like clean comedy, and, and not in the sense of it's so hard because I like them. Like I listen to Gaffigan, Regan, uh, and Papas. And I'm like, oh, those are nice, well-crafted jokes. That guy's really good. Uh, Nate Bergazzi. I love listening to a joke every once in a while from him. Clean and very good. But if you're like, hey, you're sitting in the car and for pleasure you want to listen to comedy for no studying, just like what makes you laugh, it's never a clean comedian. And I had this conversation with my brother because um, he went to a local thing that I was at. And he, every time he goes to it, he tells me the comedians that he liked, and they're always the dirtiest ones, whatever those ones are. And I'm like, oh. he's like, I just don't like clean. And I was like, what? What do you mean? You don't like Seinfeld? And he's like, no, I don't like Seinfeld. And I'm like, man, I don't really like Seinfeld. Like, I like them in the sense of, again, I like joke writing and all that, but I just don't. I'm not going to sit there and listen to it. I listen to Oh My God by Louis C.K. Um, because Beautiful Dan sent me a clip from it. And I, I just put it in the car and listened to it. And it blew my mind how good it was and how everything was just every line is a laugh every single sentence he says has a laugh in it which is insane to me to ever even if the people are there to see you to get to that level and i just will never get that from a clean comedian i don't know why i just don't get ever get that vibe out of it i see what you're saying <clears throat> and i will say on average i like i like bluer comics better but there are some like Emo Phillips and, and Ronnie Dangerfield that I, I could listen to on repeat. Brian Regan's one of them for me. I love Brian Regan. Um, the fact that they don't swear, they don't get too risky. I don't even think about it when I'm listening to them. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's some I feel that way. Emo Phillips, I'm not really thinking about. Days Clean. Um, you guys said John Mulaney earlier in the conversation. Yeah, John which... Mulaney's another. He's a little dirtier, but he's still still pretty clean. So I don't consider him a clean comic in my head, uh, but I don't know. Maybe if the evidence point out to me that he disguises it well enough where he does. He's not squeaky. But yeah. Nah, I don't think. Like, Regan, to me, is somebody where I'm like, all right, if you like that, you do like clean comedy. And if you don't like that, you probably don't like clean comedy. Because he is the pinnacle of a good joke um, for that style. It's just... Like, for instance, here's a Louis joke that uh, that I will give you an example of that just catches me off guard and made me laugh, the one I, uh, one I listened to the other day, which was he went to Europe and he had a hard time using the uh, trash containers that they have because they have, like, 12 holes in them. Like, one looks like a cup and one looks like, like a slightly different cup. And then 
he's there holding a dead baby. What is he going to do now? So that's the, there's a random turn. Uh, it's hilarious. And you're just never going to get a random dead baby punchline from Brian Regan. And, uh, I'm not saying that you have to have that to make me laugh, but there's just something that is disarming about it. Like I feel procedural when I'm listening to a clean comedian where I'm like, all right, we're in a comedy show right now where when I listen to a dirty comedian, I almost feel like we're doing a different thing. Like we're doing like a, you're saying something you're not supposed to say in a magic trick type of way that makes it amazing to hear. Uh, Chappelle's really good at that too, where he's talking about some of like the hardest things to talk about uh, in a way where you're like, I can say the N word. I'm allowed. Might as well. And for this, <laughs> that one hour, you feel like you're allowed to do it. And then you go outside and you realize that's magic. You're not allowed to do that. Yeah, don't do that. You'll end. You'll end so fast. I I, I don't know. There, there's just something. Um, I mean, we both know writing clean, writing a good clean joke is way harder than writing a good dirty joke. Um, so to see somebody at that level be able to do it with multiple hours of material uh, is is fascinating. But that aside. I do find them very. Uh, I do find I do find like Regan, the, all those guys I said very funny, and um, I will stop if I come across their clips on Instagram or whatever. I will stop and listen to every single one of them. Yeah, and I'll never do that. I like them. And I think they're good, but I'll, they'll never get me to stop. And I do agree with you. I think it is harder to write a good clean joke than it is to write a, a good blue joke. But I think that if you put them like, what's better? I think the blue joke would always reach to the higher heights uh, on the one percent scale, just because again, it, you it makes you feel like you're listening to something you're not supposed to listen to. And I grew up with South Park, so I'm like, South Park is my north star for what I think is funny. And because of that, the whole point of South Park was here is something that looks innocent, that is extremely not innocent. So I like to, you know, that's the type of comedy I like too. I think that's why I lean to write that way. I do. I've definitely gotten cleaner in the sense of uh, all a lot of my new jokes, even if they are on weirder subject matters. I just talk about them in a way that's a little bit more palatable, so it seems cleaner. Uh, but still, if I can get a good dead baby joke in there, I'm happy. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned last night, uh, I was at Soho. Uh, got a spot from Alana Foden previous guest um friend of the show huge the show. <laughs> nope, nope nope no nope. no 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 mm. she's not a piece of shit no. she's great although that is an well, endearing I'm, term for us it's an endearing term so yeah huge piece of shit <laughs> yeah there we go <laughs> but no she, we say you're she, a nice uh, person you're that's not good you don't want to hear that <laughs> she was she was uh nice enough to, to give me a spot at soho and uh mark turcott as they mentioned was was the headliner and he he was pretty clean uh very entertaining. I, I was I was locked in, uh, and I, I had some people there, and uh, I talked to them this morning, and they all loved him as well. Uh, but he yeah. was very very clever, and 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 had the ability to grab your attention and keep it throughout, uh, which is which is something that uh, it's definitely a necessity. But he he had the knack for it uh, at a higher level than than I'm used to seeing. Well, would you say that clean comedy is perhaps a worthy step for the Quest Web? <laughs> People gonna cheat. That's right, everybody. People gonna. I can't do black voice.